Please give a warm AMA welcome to Mark Schaefer and his presentation, Content Shop, The Future of Social Media. Where did you get that icon thing? An icon thing? I don't know. Just make that up. What, what do you think of uh, your phone? Just stay with Apple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad to be back with you in Minneapolis. And it's always about a little bit hoarse today because I'm from Tennessee and the allergies are so bad there. Uh, you know, spring is going crazy. We have all this pollen all over the place. You guys remember what that is? <laughs> and there's a yellow layer of stuff all over the cars. And it's like the allergy count is like 11 billion parts per billion or whatever. It's like this some record. So I was at Daryl with Jack last night. I said, oh my gosh, it's so nice to be in Minneapolis. I can breathe again. And he said, you're the first person I know that comes to Minneapolis for the weather. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, where this whole world of social media is going. And it's pretty difficult to predict, right? I mean, who saw Pinterest coming? <laughs> Nobody, all right? So what we're going to do is I think if you look at some of the trends, some of the big trends in social media, maybe this will help us predict where this is going to go. So of course, as you all know, the most powerful trend in social media is the selfie. <laughs> the second most powerful trend in social media are pictures of cats. <laughs> so I think the future of social media is self-evident. It is cat selfies. <laughs> And uh, really, that's about it. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I mean, this is it. Social media in one image. So of course it's more than that. And what I would like to do is talk a little bit about where we've been and how this is unfolding to help us see where this is going to go. Oh, who remembers this sound? <laughs> Come on, be honest. Who remembers this sound? <laughs> that is the sound of excitement. <laughs> I remember when I plugged my laptop computer into the phone jack in the wall, got that sound for the first time, and I went to the NASA website because they had pictures of galaxies there. And look, you know, there wasn't that much on the web at that point, right? And I was so excited when, you know, oh, like five minutes later, this picture is showing up on my screen. And I'm yelling to my wife, this is a miracle! Come quick! There's a picture of a galaxy coming through our phone line. The children gathered around and we, we witnessed this for the first time. And of course, you know, back then, uh, there wasn't that much to do. You know, there wasn't that much content out there. And so this was really the first revolution. Uh, getting a website out there. We're going to talk about four revolutions. And so the implication for our businesses was we had to get on board. We had to have a website, right? So uh, one of the things that, one of my points of differentiation as a teacher and as a consultant is that I am old. I can remember business even before the internet, even before email. And so uh, everybody needed to get a website, right? So what did we have before websites? Brochures. So we took these brochures over to the web person and said, we, we're falling behind. We need a website. You can use the same pictures, use the same text, just get us on board, right? Now, once we were on the web, we had to be found. And this ushered in the second revolution, and this is based on discovery. And of course, the enabling technology was Google, right? It created an entire new industry. We're now spending $26 billion a year to trick Google into thinking we're the best. <laughs> now, this 
is where we are today. We're right smack in the middle, or maybe even starting to get to the end of the third revolution. And this is a revolution based on helpfulness, service, and utility. Because now we've got these websites, and we can use social media and mobile to connect to people in wherever they can have their meeting, okay? And this is fueled by what? Content, all right? Now, one of the interesting things about this, and I'm not gonna talk about the fourth revolution yet, I'm gonna hold that toward the end, uh, because I know about that time, the lunch is gonna be kicking in, the coffee's gonna be wearing off, and I'm gonna have to come in with the, the gangbusters. <laughs> but you can see, I'm projecting that sometime by the end of 2015, something else is going to happen. But here's the problem that we're having right now. As we enter each one of these phases, the early adopters have an advantage. If you are the first one in your industry with a website, Oh, happy day. But when your competitors figure it out, it gets difficult. If you were the first one to figure out SEO, good news, good news, good news. Right? But then it gets crowded and it gets messy. And that's what's happening now. If you were the first one to figure out social media, you had a competitive advantage. But now, everybody's piled on. Everybody's creating content. And it's getting messy. So before we go to the fourth revolution, I want to talk about for our businesses, how do we get through this messiness? So I want to talk about some of the things that are going on with the web right now that are forging uh, this next uh, evolution. So I've been looking at some of the statistics. And many business analysts are projecting that the amount of information on the web is going to increase by 600% by 2020. Now, let's get our heads around this. If you can imagine the vastness of the internet as it exists right now, in the next six years, there are going to be six of those things. Is this true? I don't know. I make up about 56 or 56 percent. <laughs> but it feels about right, doesn't it? We're all kind of getting a little overwhelmed. So when I started studying this, I was thinking, well, you know what, we don't have to worry about this because the internet of things is coming, right? That's what's going to be causing all this data, all this information, the internet of things. You know, the sensors and everything, right? So the sensors in the dirt, and, the, and like the dirt is talking to the trees, and the trees are talking to the roads, and the roads are talking to the refrigerators, saying it's time to get more beer. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, that's where this is coming from. No. 75% of this tsunami of information is coming from us. Where do you think all these selfies are going to go? Blog posts and videos and, you know, whatever people are posting out there. So this is kind of the supply side of what's going on with information on the internet. Now let's look at the demand side. And I want to present this in two different ways. First, as you can see here, that for everyone in this room, and in fact, everybody that we have ever known in our lives, we've lived in a world where we have always consumed more content. And today, on average, an adult in America is consuming about 10 hours of content a day. So the first thing to think about here is, is there a limit? Is this going to keep going up? So this is the first thing to think about. The second thing, I want to show this chart in a second way. <coughs> Here is the content we're consuming. And you can see very clearly here that every time we, well maybe not the people in the back, but the people in the front can see very clearly. 
that every time there's some new technological innovation, it pumps up the jams on the content we consume. And TV here is both traditional TV and digital TV, right? So Hulu and Netflix and all the ways, right? That's included in this too. So this is coming from a number of different sources. So a couple of big takeaways here is number one, is there a limit to what's going on? And number two, is there an innovation coming down the line that's going to pump this up? And should we be worrying about that? So, uh, one of the things uh, that I've been thinking about is this, this professor at USC said by 2015, we're going to be consuming 15 and a half hours of content a day. I was thinking, let's do the math on that. On average, we still sleep eight hours a day. That means 23 and a half hours a day are going to be consuming content or sleeping. The problem is, on average, Americans spend 32 minutes a day in the bathroom. <laughs> we're two minutes over. <laughs> the implication, of course, is we're going to stop brushing our teeth. <laughs> because YouTube is so endlessly fascinating. Something's got to get. Well, what is the limit? I don't know. Is it 12 hours a day? Is it 13 hours a day? I, I don't know. But I think we have to be thinking about it. A concern I have is that we're lulling ourselves into a false sense of security as marketers that we've lived in a world where content consumption has always gone up and it's going to keep going up. And I don't think that's going to be the case. So let's look at this graphically expressed in exabytes of information. What is an exabyte? I really don't know, I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm, I'm using Exabyte because I think it makes me look deep cheap. And that's what I'm kind of aiming for. <laughs> I really don't know what an Exabyte is, but it's something big. And we never had one Exabyte of information on the web until 2005. Now check it out. By 2020, just six years, we're going to have like 60 Exabytes of information. Now, let's lay on top of this <laughs> this concept that there's some physiological limit to the amount of content we consume. I don't know what it's going to be, but we have to sleep eventually. So, so there's this concept that, in the, that we're, we can kind of illustrate here that the idea is it's just going to get harder because the amount of information that's competing for the attention of our customers is going up, 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 up. And it's it, it just a typically incredible pace, an overwhelming uh, pace. Now, this isn't just theoretical. We're starting to see this happen in the real world, where it's getting harder and harder to compete for almost everybody in the room. This is probably a very familiar chart. Just a few years ago, if we were doing a really great job with our content, and we were being consistent, and we were playing nice with Facebook, we could expect about 26% of our followers would see our stuff. I mean, that seems kind of modest, but at least it's something. Today, the research from late 2013, early 2014, is saying 8%. And, and, and when I gave this talk last week, people were saying, I think it's more like 5% or below, all right? Why, why? This is how Facebook explained it. This was an executive from Facebook in the Wall Street Journal in December, a guy named Richard Sims. He said, on average, the, the average person coming on Facebook can see 1,500 different stories. There's just too much stuff. They've got this algorithm called EdgeRank, and they're ratcheting it down. So this is kind of like content shock right before our eyes. There's more and more stuff. There's a limited amount of attention, and there's a cost to this. There's a cost to this, right? We've got to create even better stuff to get through that algorithm, or we've literally got to give Facebook money, right, to have our stuff shown. Now, when I show this chart, I mean, I've been around business for a while, 
a lot of the uh, pundits in the field say, oh, well, you know, the answer to this is simple. We just have to create epic shit. <laughs> I've been around a while, and, and I'm thinking, if I took this chart to my boss, my boss said, what are you doing about this? We're spending all this money on this content. We're spending all this money on you to publish it on Facebook, and this is what's happening to our organic reach. And I said, boss, you got it covered. Starting tomorrow, we're making epic shit. <laughs> and I really don't think epic shit is a strategy. And because what happens when the competitors become epicer? It's a never-ending cycle, right? There's some cost to this, all right? So what I want to talk about is I want to give you some things to think about of what can you do. What can you do to get through this transition until we're in this fourth revolution? So really, what our challenge is is how do we hold on to this mind share? All this data is going into our, cu our customers' brains. And how do we keep that, how do we keep our share? How do we fight for that uh, among all this overwhelming competition? So I'm going to talk about four ideas. And the first one is called shock and awe. Here is the dirty little secret of content marketing that nobody wants to talk about. You don't have to be the best. You just have to be first and overwhelmed. And that's really what you're trying to do, essentially, is create content shock for your competitors. You're trying to squeeze them up. Let's look at an example of how this works. Now, I like to use this example because it's a really difficult marketing challenge. This is a case study about a medical clinic. Anybody here in the healthcare, healthcare industry? Maybe 10 or 12? So, so some people are gonna afraid to raise their hand because they don't know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> You've heard me talk before. Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of industries, you know, medical, insurance, pharmaceutical, that are really behind in a lot of these areas because they've got patient privacy issues, regulatory issues, right? Now, this isn't just any medical clinic. This is also a medical clinic that does cosmetic surgery. Expensive uh, uh, surgery that uh, is normally not covered by insurance, and it gets even worse. And then you say, how can it possibly get worse? It gets worse because this starts in 2009, the teeth of the recession. And what are they doing? They're advertising, radio, TV, newspaper. Their business is going down, down, down. What happens when your business goes down? You advertise more. You shout even louder. You didn't hear us the first time. Now come into our clinic. It wasn't working. Their business was dying. Their competitors were dying. So the person, the, the business director for this clinic took one of my classes and said, we have to change. We're going to change our strategy. They cut their advertising budget. They said, instead of sell, 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 we are going to help. We are going to teach. We are going to educate. And the first thing they did is they brainstormed all the questions that anybody could have about the procedures that they do, and they started answering them. They would put one of these questions on a poll on Facebook every Wednesday. It might be something like, what's the leading cause of skin damage? A, B, C, D. And they would answer it on Friday on a YouTube video, created by the actual doctor. It humanized the business. You could see his face, you could hear his voice, you could kind of get to know him. Then they would take out somebody, got the answer right, randomly, they would pull out a winner, and that person won a free prize of skin cream but you had to come to the clinic to pick it up. So they're driving traffic through the contest. This starts to work. They move into Twitter. They move into blogging. Why is blogging so important? Google loves blogs. They love the words. They love the, the, the keywords. They're helping their search customers find the answers. Google is the 800 number today, right? If you've got a question about something, you don't call somebody. You write the question on Google. Right? Who's picking up the phone? 
Is it your competitors? Is it somebody who loves you? Is it somebody who hates you? In this business, he was literally the only one picking up the phone. They said, how can we be even more helpful? This is starting to work. People are coming to our clinic. They created e-books. They created other types of content uh, because they thought, well, some people might not want to engage with us on these private matters. Let's create an e-book. And they thought, how can we be even more interesting? How can we be even more helpful? This is going to blow your mind. They created a cookbook. Why? Because they love the cook. And they wanted to be human. They wanted to create something valuable. They did a beautiful hardcover cookbook. They gave it away to everybody that they knew over the Christmas holidays. And this is what happened. People opened up this book. They had it out in their kitchen. They were cooking recipes from the book at Christmas or over the holidays. And people were saying, this is delicious. Where did you get this recipe? This probably got it from this medical clinic. <laughs> They're owning the conversation at Christmas dinner. And this is something that we're going to come back to this. But I want you to start thinking about this as a, as a key idea and a metric for marketing today. What would it take for you and your business to own a disproportionate share of the conversation about your business? Whatever you do, real estate, insurance, services, what would it take? What behaviors would that drive in your company if your goal was to own a disproportionate share of the conversation? We'll, we'll get back to that, okay? Now, this thing really worked. In less than three years, they created more than a thousand pieces of, con of content, 300 YouTube videos alone. Their revenue was up 19% during their session as their competitors were closing their doors. Their conversion rate, meaning the people who came in for a consultation and actually bought something, went up from 50% to 70%. Why? Because people felt they knew the doctor. They saw his face, they heard the voice, they said, we feel like we already know you. And they had the top ranking for all key search terms, not only in their region, but nationally. They became a national medical clinic. People were flying in from all over the country because they felt they knew and trusted this doctor. And what was their advertising budget during this period? Zero. They did this all through social media and content marketing. So here are the rules for shock and awe. Number one, this medical clinic had found an unsaturated niche. All right? Now, if you're number two in this business, you're going to have to find another way to promote your business. Because this guy owns it. All right? He dominated the niche with useful, relevant content. Number two, you need to have an aggressive strategy around your content based on keywords, and then you never stop. Google is always looking, this is one creepy stage. <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't have eaten the cake. <laughs> you decide. <laughs> oh man, I'm way off track now. Minneapolis, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so, never stop. This is a very useful slide. It reminds me what I'm talking about. Uh, and Google wants fresh, relevant content, okay? So this is the key to shock and awe. Now, the second idea is if your pipeline into your customer's brain is becoming squeezed, borrow a bigger pipeline. And this explains marketing buzzwords like sponsored content. Or companies are paying bloggers to show up, you know, in their content. Newsjacking, associating your products with hot news events. Native advertising, trying to get advertising messages into the edit editorial portion of newspapers and websites. Landscaping. Why did Geico do a commercial with the Pillsbury Doughboy? Because Geico has a pipeline, Pillsbury has a pipeline. They're combining their pipelines to make a bigger pipeline. And then influence marketing. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time, I wish we had 
a whole hour just to talk about this because it's, it's so interesting, it's so relevant, and so important for you to understand this now because it's so new. It can only be happening in the last few years. I'm going to give you an example of how this works. This is a friend of mine named Anna O'Reilly. I met Anna about two and a half years ago uh, in uh, London. And I had, we had dinner with some friends and I met these started talking. And um, Anna is a very bright person. She's a very experienced business person. But the recession was still pretty tough in the UK. And she was in between jobs. And I started telling her about how we all have this new opportunity. We have widespread access to the high-speed internet and these amazing free publishing tools like blogging, Twitter, Facebook, that anybody now can start publishing and create their own voice. And in fact, that's basically how I was building my reputation. She said, I, you know, I love to travel. So she said, I'm, I'm going to start a travel blog. So this is what her travel blog has looked like over the last few months as far as the traffic going to her site. So just by grabbing this opportunity, influence now has been democratized. Here's a person that just loves travel. She came out of nowhere and has become one of the most respected travel bloggers in the world. She has her own media kit. These are some of the companies that she's working for now. Because these are the people that are moving content. An ability to create content that moves is the source of power on the web today. And if we can find the people who are doing that, we can help move the needle for our business. All right? Now, uh, so this is a really key idea. The ability to create content that moves, that gets shared, has democratized influence. All right? Brands, we don't need to necessarily line up with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie anymore. We need to find these people who are moving the needle. Now let me give you an example of how a brand can actually use this. And again, I picked Listerine because on the Shaper Sexy Scale, this is about a 2.3. It's about a tenth of a percent higher than printer cartridges. But I, I use examples like this because I figured if I can show you how to create excitement about this screen on the social web and sell more stuff, maybe there's help for you too. So here's some data that the brand manager for this screen can look at now. This is a report created by a company called Opinions. And what they're doing is they're measuring share of conversation, our old friend. So they're looking across 6 million online sources, and they're saying, look at the conversation about oral care. There are passionate experts out there on oral care. Who are these crazy people? I'm not even in it. Now, so here's the first thing we can see as a brand manager. There's a big conversation going on about oral care, but they're not really talking about this dream. There's a little bit of overlap, but the conversations about this dream are not very big. We can also see 75% of the conversations about oral care are taking place on blogs. 82% of the conversations about this dream are on Twitter. We can fix this. I want to find these blogs. Now, with a click of the button, we can start finding who are these influencers. This is basically the Anna O'Reilly of oral care. She's the one who's creating content that's moving in this business. And we can see she's the editor of an online uh, magazine, and she's talking about press and oral e, the competition. Is this somebody we need to know? Is this somebody? What would we do as a business if our goal is to own a disproportionate share of the conversation? Don't you think that would be a great leading indicator to sales? I think it would. So that's a little bit about influence marketing. A third idea is to atomize content, which simply means make it smaller. So this explains social media trends like nine, six second videos, Pinterest, pretty pictures, and infographics. 
You know, I don't have time to read your damn blog post. Just send me a graphic so I can understand this quickly. So I think one of the things to think about in this era of increased competition for mind share, what can we do to make our content more consumable, more consumer friendly? Oops. <coughs> The last one I want to talk about today, before we get to the fourth revolution, is this idea of right. R-I-T-E. As Jack uh, mentioned uh, in his beautiful opening speech, uh, I teach uh, at Rutgers University, and uh, one of the classes that I teach there in the marketing program is creating content for the web. And one of the things we talk about is to use this filter of all ITEs. It's easy to remember. Do you create content that is relevant, interesting, timely, and entertaining? And I think consistently, if you look at the, at the content that's really taking off on the web, you'll see this theme. And I think if you create content through this lens, over time, you'll be creating content that's shared. Because remember, power on the web comes from not just creating content, it has to move, it has to ignite. We have to find our audience, we have to help them by creating content that's shareable. Now, of these four, I think the big word is entertainment. As we go into this period of increased competition, if you think about the content you like to share, chances are there's some entertainment value. It's really compelling, it's really interesting, it's like there's a wow to it, right? Maybe it's like a bride falling into a swimming pool. That's what we used to share on the web, right? Uh, so let's look at an example of this. How many know the Chipotle case study? Probably quite a few in this group, okay. Uh, so Chipotle, uh, look, let's do a reality check here. They sell burritos, all right? 3.2 on the shape of sexy scale. Much better than the stream. And yet, commodity like it. And let's look what Chipotle is doing to sell burritos. Uh, for the last two years, they've created claymation mini movies. And so I'm, uh, I'm sorry if you don't have time to look at this thing, but go on YouTube. You can see, uh, I mean, they probably got over 8 million views by now. This is, uh, I mean, they had 7 million views when I did this screenshot. It's a 2 minute and 20 second Clay Nation movie to a song by Coldplay, sung by Willie Nelson. And at the end of this video, you can download the song for free on iTunes. And easy. And that's not cheap. But it sure is entertaining. And, and if you look at their stock price, they are posting the competition right now. Uh, so this is one of the things I think is going to be such a challenge is, is to start to move our thinking around content, which has been so very useful, to think about, look, the content I like to share is entertaining. How do we be more entertaining? And I think that's going to be a challenge because most of our companies, we don't sit around in our cubicles thinking, how can we be more entertaining today? But I think this is going to be a big word. I think this is going to be a big challenge as we go forward. Now, you're probably thinking right now, how can this possibly get more interesting? <laughs> but it is, because now we're going to talk about the future. And yes, I did bring out the Cheeto Dog, because I know your energy level is probably starting to, to be sat. That delicious chicken is starting to take over your body now. You're starting to feel sleepy from the trip to fan in the chicken. And I had to pull out all the stops and brought out the Cheeto dog. Because when a dog dresses up like this, he's going incognito. Now, <laughs> that is cheap. And I own that. <laughs> but at this point, I'm doing anything I can to keep you happy. Because we're heading in the end. We've got 10 minutes left, and we're going to talk about the future. So this is where we left our little graph. 
And this is where we're going. This is what's going to be happening in the next few years. We're going to be heading into a, uh, a time in digital marketing where the key where we're going to be moving away from utility and service to immersive interactive experiences. And the technology that's going to enable this is wearable technology, augmented reality, and these advanced filters. These advanced filters are going to help our customers deal with this immense amount of information coming at us. So let's take a look a little bit about what's, what we can expect in the next couple of years as this begins to grow and create critical mass. So what we're seeing today in many, many market studies and psychological studies, the people are feeling so bombarded, really almost overwhelmed. I mean, I'll give you a personal example. I tried to buy electronics at, at Best Buy. So I thought, well, I'm going to be cool, and I'm going to be cheap. I'm going to look at all the reviews of these different products. And I was so overwhelmed, I was paralyzed by all the information that's available. So uh, how many have heard of this app called Zeit? OK, maybe five or 10. All right. I think this is a glimpse of where these filters are going. Zeit is kind of like the Pandora of content. The more you use it, the more it learns about you. All right? So I go on to Zeit, you set up this app, and you say, I'm interested in travel and cooking and baseball, and Zeit starts to bring you content. And as you connect to the stories, and you can vote them up and down, they get smarter and smarter and smarter. And after a couple of weeks, this is addictive. I can't get off this thing because it knows everything I love. Now, that's good for me. It's bad for marketers because I'm not Googling anymore for my content. Zeit knows I love BMW. If you're if you know I'm looking for a car and you're doing marketing for Audi, if your information makes it onto Zeit, that's a filter fail. It isn't going to happen, right? Interesting, right? Let's take this to the next level. Watson. Everybody, anybody here, Watson, the IBM computer that beat Jeopardy? Remember that two years ago? All right. This is the first cognitive computer. Talk about a filter. They don't code Watson, they train it. And Watson can solve these complex problems. And when it gives you a result, it doesn't give you a list of blog posts. It gives you the answer. Two years ago, when it beat Jeopardy, this computer was as big as a bedroom. Now it's as big as a pizza box. And it's 24 times faster. In the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to have this on our smartphone. We're not going to be Googling. We're going to be citing and watching, I guess. I've just created a room. Watson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So when I talked to the people who were working on this, I said, so I'm thinking now, how do I get my content into this? You know, how does Watson say, oh, the answer to this question is, call Mark Schaefer. <laughs> Uh, it's not that funny. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. So the lady kind of looked at me, she thought a minute, and she said, we don't think of it as content. We think of it as fuel. Right, interesting. Interesting. How is content marketing going to evolve? That we are going to have to supply fuel these filters. We're going to have to supply the information. It may not be an entertaining blog post with lots of pretty graphics. It might be in some new form that is used by these advanced uh, filters. So the strategy behind social media marketing, content marketing, has been pretty straightforward up until now. We create great content. We figure out a way to trick Google to get in the search results. And Oh, happy day. Now, it's getting more complicated. 
because this content is going to be fed to us in so many different ways through filters and applications and cognitive computing. And you know, I saw uh, another uh, marketing blogger, one of their blogs came into my site stream. <coughs> and I was thinking, are, is my content ending up in other people's site stream? Do I need not to think about SEO? Do I need to think about ZEO? So these are some of the challenges I think we're going to be facing. Where is this going to lead? I don't know, but I think one strategy that will emerge is how we create marketing so compelling that we invite people out of their filters. Come spend time with us, says the people from Audi. We have something really amazing to show you. And this might be coming through augmented reality. So we talked about this technology that could possibly pump up consumption, and I think this is what it's going to be. Now, let's see, whoops, I had another chart here. Oh, okay, maybe it helps. Okay, so uh, you've probably seen crude examples of augmented reality. Uh, my favorite application, I've got an app on my smartphone that's a zombie finder. So, I mean, I could... I'm going to kind of use that right now. Uh, it works really well. I found out that my wife is a zombie. And uh, it's kind of awkward. I think just because they don't know they're dead. So it's weird. It's just it's weird. But with wearable technology, we're not going to have those openers anymore, like a smartphone or a tablet. The internet is going to surround us like the air that we breathe. Every wall, I mean, five years from now, I'm going to be coming, there's going to be all this stuff on the walls and on the ceiling, and you're going to be using virtual bazookas to shoot these things, and I'm going to be giving you points. If you get the most points, I'm going to give you a book. You're going to say, why would anybody want that? I said, well, maybe it's a good book. <laughs> but I mean, we have to start thinking about, you know, what is marketing going to look like? What is content going to look like? How are we going to interact with the world when everything can become interactive? A page, a label on a product. Oh, there's, this, there's some of the slides I was looking for before. I'm not going to have a word. What are we going to do when the, everything around us, there's a virtual layer on top of the real world? I think this idea of entertainment is going to evolve to being to play. Because we love to play more than anything. The people that play World of Warcraft, on average, spend six hours a day playing that game. It's almost like having another career. And there's a whole <laughs> psychology and philosophy about that. How do you get these games to be so immersive and so interactive that they literally become addictive? I learned in Germany they have two hospitals now to get people over game addiction, okay? But how do we create immersive experiences, fun experiences for our businesses? What are the opportunities when any city street can become a game? What are the opportunities when every building, uh, every shopping experience can be something we can play with? It's going to be an amazing time. We need to be thinking about this idea. What does digital marketing look like when there are no um, this is going to be as profound or more profound than the internet because the internet is going to be all around us. Now, I want to leave you with one final thought. I think we might have time, a little time for questions. But I want to leave you with one final thought. We've talked a lot today about this intersection of technology and marketing and people. And yet, I think there's one other big thing that's really important to take away from this. And I got to interview this great scholar, Dr. Ralph Robert Chalini. He's written books on, uh, on, on power and influence in the workplace. And I got to interview him when I was working on one of my books. And I said, Dr. Chalini, how does a person stand out in this crowded world? And he said something I think about every day. Be more human. It's so simple. It's so profound. Where's Mr. Dow? 
met him earlier. All right, stand up. He promised me he would be here. <laughs> anyway, he was telling me that they're moving off robotic tweets. And they cut their advertising budget to hire more people so that they can engage more on the web. Okay? I think that's really a great idea. And uh, if you were here, I'd probably be getting one fabulous prizes right now. Be more human. Be more human. In this era of information overload, like, I think this is the killer app. These real connections we can make on the web, we have to realize that to, we need to cut through this digital divide and realize the people we see in these pictures are real people who need us. They're experiencing problems. Maybe they're experiencing joy. And the, this historically important opportunity to really connect with people on the web leads to awareness. Awareness leads to engagement. Engagement leads to loyalty. And loyalty trumps everything. It trumps SEO. It trumps backlinks. It trumps filters. Be more human. I think that's the tour out for the content shop page. Thank you very much. What? Did you make fun of me? Get up here. <laughs>